you. Well, I feel like I'm in the company of giants here, and here's me and my little talk. Um, uh, <coughs> the title of my talk is Reimagining Rural Landscapes. I love this idea of, of reimagining. I, I thought it was a word that I coined, but I think it's come up about five times today. Um, I don't know if I wrote the title of the talk, but I felt this entrepreneur's perspective to be perhaps a little self-aggrandizing, so I thought I'd give you a definition <laughs> of what an entrepreneur is. Someone that has to lead themselves around. And often somebody who comes up with really creative ideas that they believe are fantastic, um, but may not necessarily be. So here I am, this is my little story. Um, so Cassinia started about, about, gee, it's 18 years ago now. And our vision is to, to reimagine, and that word's been up there for, for, quite, for a few years now, the landscape where environmental, social and agricultural outcomes are integrated. And we're about reconnection um, with uh, biodiversity of vegetation, storing carbon, establishing habitat, et cetera, et cetera. We'd love to see a plan come together that, that looked at a, a, a sort of a hundred year scale of how do we do this, um, and we'd love to be a part of that conversation. Um, in terms of our, what we do and, and where we've come from and, and sort of the scale of, of what we are, um, we're focused on private land, on biodiversity on private land. We've purchased about 6,000 hectares for conservation, um, mainly in Victoria, um, but we're also working in South Australia and New South Wales. Um, we've purchased around 30 properties, um, actually a couple of them now, a few of them now, with uh, Nigel Sharp, who Doug was just, just mentioning. Um, and the drivers for us have been, have been carbon revegetation for carbon credits. Um, we've been working in biodiversity markets, both state and federal, and we've also done some voluntary biodiversity credit stuff, which I think we're probably the first to sort of use the, the state system and the, the native vegetation credit register to move into the voluntary biodiversity market. Uh, we've done some ag stuff, focused uh, again around conservation and, and working with Trust for Nature to sort of really integrate um, sort of low input <coughs> native pastures in agriculture. And then there's this reimagining piece that it says if we, if we bring in these other drivers, what, is it, what does it look like? How do we integrate agriculture, conservation and people? And interestingly, and I find this one of the, you know, I find variety to be the, the thing that keeps it, it interesting. Um, we also were involved in developing Australia, uh, sorry, developing Africa's first forestry clean development mechanism project. Because I think that's so interesting, I thought I'd stick a slide up about it. I won't talk any more about it, but um, we did this beautiful uh, sort of 3,000 hectare reveg project in southern Ethiopia. And the guy I was working with, Tony Renato, who many of you might know, um, is a fantastic NRM guy. It's just been awarded the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for this type of work from a, an organisation in Norway. So, yeah, that's a great part of life. Um, just in terms of our story, uh, so I did a master's degree. I'm, I'm one of the few people I know who did a degree in what they ended up <laughs> doing. I did a master's degree researching attitudes to private land conservation. And 20 years later, I'm working in private land conservation. 2000, I started, I had this idea of let's... Uh, Let's, let's use carbon to, uh, to um, offset, let's use trees to offset carbon and let's get paid to do it and start a greenhouse balanced. There's a four year gap there. In 2004, we opened a bank account because we had our first sale. Um, so it was sort of a, a labor of love without even the need for a bank account until 2004. Uh, and that first sale I did um, was actually to the Bendigo Bank. Um, thank you. And uh, I think I sold it for $3,000 and, and I actually employed Greening Australia to work with me and do it and they got $2,700. So <laughs> it, wasn't, it was a lean first four years. Um, but uh, in 2000, like these things that often take time, I managed to quit my day job in 2005 and, and we started to sort of get an understanding of how this could work and purchased our first property in 2008 and then we bought like, you know, one and a half average properties per year since then. 2015, I was able to, I'd had sort of part-time staff, but we sort of reached the capacity where we could have full-time staff and, and now we've got a couple of full-time staff plus part-timers and contractors. So that's sort of, you know, sort of 20 years really um, 
but we're just starting to get to some sort of scale now, it feels. Just in terms of a few projects that we've done, some of you might know the McCarg Range, and if Rob Yule was here, he'd know this property really well. Um, we did a, a big reveg project. Um, partly, again, I think was uh, some of this early stuff was with the Vinigo Bank as well for carbon. So saw some real landscape change in that space. And I actually live really close to McCarg Range, so I'd look at this this site probably twice a week and, and it's great to see the change that's happened in that time. In terms of where we work, um, this map is actually not fully current, there's a few more, but we're sort of spread across the state and we've got some stuff happening in South Australia as well and we have done some work in Tasmania, although we've never owned property in, in Tasmania. Um, just wanted to talk about the drivers for you know, people like me. I mean, I feel like 6,000 hectares in the, in the context of bush heritage or in the context of, you know, what needs to be done is, is scratching the surface. But it's, it's interesting that there's enough opportunities for people like me to be able to be working in this space. And, and I think particularly, I suppose, Victoria is, is the hardest state to, to achieve scale. Um, so what is it that's given us this opportunity? I think change is the thing, and I think if, if I was to take on the mantle of an entrepreneur, I think we're always going to be looking for changes that provide opportunities. Changing economics of ag um, are an opportunity, and, and they certainly were when agriculture was really depressed, um, but they can also be a threat too. And we've seen stuff that we've protected, that we've felt, you know, over the fence was really not in danger of being damaged, you know, we're protecting this, we're covenanting it, but over the fence is probably pretty safe, and then drivers will you know, change, cropping becomes a lot more profitable, all of a sudden there's a lot more land that had never been cropped before, is being cropped, so change brings threats as well. I think one of the drivers that's really enabled us is the emergence of environmental markets um, and, you know, carbon and biodiversity. Um, that's been something that's opened up opportunities for us. And I think there's been a change, and this is, this is still happening, but changing attitudes to, to conservation and more interest in the intrinsic value um, of what you know, natural systems are, rather than just the utilitarian value, and recognize, recognition of the environmental crisis. I think we can all see, but you know, not everyone can see, um, but that's becoming more more, more commonly ex accepted. So I just thought I'd run through what makes a project for us. How do we do what we do? Um, and I also, I brought this along, Doug, wherever you are, Doug. Um, I bought the paper that uh, Doug mentioned. This is the ALCA uh, conference that I went to last week that Doug was also at. And that's a fantastic resource. I'm sure it's probably downloadable on their website. But just in terms of in terms of capturing the opportunities that, uh, that we can in terms of um, moving to more, more conservation focused uh, land management. Um, so the ALCA paper sort of identified 25 different sectors. So the, the opportunities are, are more diverse than we often think. think. Um, essentially they're involved in providing a service that somebody needs and that might be government investment, that might be voluntary markets for carbon, that might be philanthropy. And most of these projects that we've done, I think every project that we've done has had more than one driver. So um, pulling together a blended finance was the term that Doug used, but uh, you know, a patchwork, I, used, I, I, I often compare it to quilting, you're using little bits of, of lots of things to try to pull something together to make one beautiful project. We, when we're looking at a project though, we always have to look at you know, strategic value. Could this opportunity be, be, be placed better elsewhere. Um, one thing that, that I think that we've done um, maybe effectively is, is realise that, that opportunities, don't, they come and then they go. So we need to be quick. Timing is often a decision maker in terms of whether a project will, will be a project that we'll really pursue. Because um, when the opportunity changed, the way land is managed is real, then you want to take that opportunity because it doesn't come up very often. Um, often we're looking geographically and we want to focus in a particular area and obviously the quality of the asset protected um, makes, it, makes it a big impact on whether it'll be a project for us. Um, 
We like bringing strategic partners together. Um, Trust for Nature have been probably our most um, close partner in all in all of what we've done. Um, we've protected more, we've covenanted more land with Trust for Nature than anybody else. So they've been on with the journey right from the start. And Tim Reid, who I was talking to over lunch, was the the first. Uh, Trust for Nature um, regional manager that I worked with, and it was great to reconnect with him. Um, so who shares our vision? Who complements our skills? What can we do together? Can we do more together than separately? And how do we make this better for people? Um, environmental markets are usually involved, and we've got sort of three or four spaces we're playing there. And yeah, we like to reimagine landscapes. What would this look like um, to be better for people? What would it look like to, for agriculture to be embedded in this in this whole landscape, you know, not just the projects we're doing. What, what, what if we could have our time again? What would that look like? What can we learn from indigenous management? How can we embed that into what we do? And uh, how can we, um, in the same way that we're we're offering value or we're recognising the, the natural value and we're covenanting land, what would it look like to to covenant? Indigenous value, and that's a conversation that we're having and thinking through with many of the same people, probably that Doug's talking about. Just wanted to put up a little example, just to sort of make it a little bit tangible. Um, so this is a, a this is a property that we purchased. This is the first big property we purchased, and this is the one we did with Tim. It's 950 hectares. It's near Mount Karong, just to the north of Mount Karong. Um, so we we knew it had a lot of um, listed species on it, um, snowy mint bush, it had a, a lot of woodland birds and Jim Radford had a lot of his work on woodland birds, a lot of the, the birds of bush heritage have seen at Nardo Hills, had also been seen here. Um, initially when I f we f saw this we were wondering how could we possibly do it and the sort of penny dropped, maybe we could do it ourselves. So this is our, our first project that we purchased. Um, so you can see this photo, this aerial photo was taken right when we started and I should have another photo but I just threw this slide in at, at the last minute. I should have a photo of what it looks like now. But um, you can see there's a, bit of fair, there's a fair bit of cropping land and there's a few key remnants and then there's a couple of really significant areas which are the bright green bits. So we've taken that, we've reimagined it from a, from a titles perspective. It was in 15 titles and now it's in eight. Um, We've, uh, we've revegetated the whole thing, uh, all, the, all the formerly cropped areas, and then we've resold it. So that the way we've managed to pull the project together is by purchasing, doing some carbon stuff, and then you know, recouping the initial costs by, by reselling. And James, yeah, James Booth, is, uh, he's purchased one of, these, one of these blocks who's here today. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good example of, of sort of what we do. Um, Subsequent to us uh, doing this project, the count, the Lon Shires actually rezoned this to rural conservation. Now, the fact that it had Trust for Nature covenant on it meant that it probably didn't need to be rezoned, but um, it's uh, it's now sort of recognised from a council perspective in that way. And we've got a really interesting cooperative management sort of approach. We actually Tim's idea: we took out all the fences. So if you were to go onto any one of these blocks, there are no fences, no boundary fences. Um, obviously boundary fences around the edge but no boundary internal boundary fences between the lots so it it's really been an interesting model of, of cooperative management it's like a, a, a focused you know um, contrived land care group in a way but it's it's working really well another thing we found on here um, and Jim's other half um, was the was the finder of this is the robust greenhood so in, in Taking this land aside for conservation and then starting to do some surveys, we found this, the robust greenhood, which had been declared extinct, was initially found on Bush Heritage's block and then subsequently a pretty big population was found on this property too. So there's some really interesting, unexpected and beautiful um, surprises came our way too. In terms of the future, um, I think the drivers, and I think this has come up in just about every presentation. Um, agriculture manages most of the landscape. Um, the future must include agriculture. Um, this conference, the second point for the future, the conference we went to last week, um, we had a couple of speakers from the US um, sharing, and their definition for, of conservation is much broader than ours, and it really made me think perhaps this, um, perhaps the future involves 
thinking about agriculture and conservation much more collaboratively. Um, yeah, there's a few thoughts there. I think environmental markets have a lot to offer. Some people are nervous about them or think that they're sort of um, immoral, um, but they do bring you know, they do bring capital, they bring innovation, they bring scrutiny, which is important. And they're more widespread in other parts of the world than they are here. They can be good or bad, but they can be good if they're well they're well designed and well conceived. Um, one thing um, Michael's presentation made me think, and I just added that this point four in on the back of that. We've got an idea that, that it would be great to see a bit like the, the Mount Karong example where we've got collaborative management between a whole lot of landholders across the landscape. We think that sort of model in sort of peri-urban areas could work around agriculture as well as conservation. What would it look like if we are, have got these less than economically viable farmlets were managed by one landholder share farming and, and seeing conservation and agriculture embedded into a landscape a landscape that's owned by many different people. But when the development you know, is conceived, that's set up in a way that guarantees a good management of land in that way. And finally, indigenous knowledge is valuable and, and can bring wisdom as well as knowledge. Um, and we've ha we've the South Australian property we've just purchased this year, actually, um, we purchased it uh, in collaboration with uh, an indigenous couple, Naranjeri couple, and, and I think they're, it's really sort of expanded my mind, their perspective on the sacredness of the land and the sacredness of the, of the relationship between the people and the land is really valuable. Not just that the land is sacred and we're not, but there's a sacred relationship that's happening there. And I just want to finish with this. Our, our values as a company really focus on humility, respect, and this idea of dreaming, and I'm not going to go right into it, but I'm still trying to understand these concepts, they're very important. But this guy on the $50 note, David Unipen, um, is an Aaron Jerry man. So the, the guys that we purchased this property with in South Australia, they're in their 60s and they actually grew up with him. So he's Uncle David to them. Um, but on the, on the $50 note, if you look on that, that little bit of text down the bottom, um, it's a bit hard to read, but what it says is, as a full-blooded member of my race, I think I may claim to be the first and I hope not the last to produce an enduring record of our customs, beliefs and imaginings. And I was talking to my friend Clyde about this idea of imaginings and, and he said, imaginings <coughs> captures hopes, dreams, aspirations and imaginings are, are really important. So reimaginings, right back to the start of my talk, reimaginings and reimagining landscapes. In this, in this attitude of humility and, and sacredness and shared management, um, I think is really important and more valuable now than ever. So thank you.